1672, a stone church was erected in the village of Montreal, the axis of Notre Dame Street, in what's now Bast Arms. In 1823, the Sulpicians of Notre Dame decided to construct a larger church for their growing congregation and to make the new structure a monument to Montreal's French Catholic population. The new church was constructed between 1824 and 1829 and was the first church in Canada built in the Gothic Revival style. But it wouldn't be until the 1840s that the bell towers were added, and not until 1865 that the current facade was complete, with the installation of the three statues of Saint Joseph the Virgin Mary, and St. John Baptiste. The interior decorations were completed in 1880, and in 1921, the church was raised to the rank of minor basilica. New stained glass windows were installed to mark the centennial celebrations in 1929. According to the basilica, the stained glass windows are representations of the history of the foundation of Montreal. This makes the stained glass at Montreal Basilica unique, because stained glass usually depicts biblical scenes or motifs. In 1989, Notre Dame de Montreal was designated a National Historic Site. Today on Historia Nostra, we're walking through Notre Dame de Montreal and considering how historical memory is presented by the Basilica Stained Glass Windows. I'm not an expert in French-Canadian history, so I spoke to two people who are. I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, I'm a historian specialized in the, the historiography of Quebec. My books were about uh, Dollard des Ormeaux and his, uh, uh, the, the myth of Dollard des Ormeaux. Uh, I also wrote about uh, Benjamin Sult, who was uh, a prominent uh, historian and uh, one of the founders of commemoration, uh, both in Quebec and in Canada. And I recently published a biography of François-Xavier Garneau, who was the founder of uh, historiography in Canada. So those are my credits. So I'm Dominique Deslandre. I'm a professor at the University of Montréal, uh, teaching history of New France and France in the 17th and 18th century. Dr. Deslandre has written several books and articles on Indigenous French encounters including about 17th century French missions in France and New France, and an edited volume about the 350 years of history of the Sulpicians of Montreal, who were essential to the evolution of the city and region of Montreal, as well as the building of Notre Dame Basilica. Dr. Delandre and Gru walked me through the history behind each stained glass window. The scenes depicted are laid out roughly chronologically around the basilica's ground floor. The first, on our right, as we come in, depicts Jacques Cartier's visit to Hachalaga in 1535. I'll let the experts take it from here. This is the famous abstract of the Rel Relation du Canada of Jacques Cartier. He's in uh, Hachalaga. It's a story that, of course, has a religious aspect. He is reading the Gospels. It's uh, more or less really the encounter between two worlds that is uh, storied here. And it's uh, and especially it's the bringing of the gospel to the natives. Even if Cartier only visited, he was the first Frenchman to do that. So the, the indigenous people came and uh, surrounded him with uh, people sick, and then he, he poses himself as um, a saint, or the thaumaturge we say in French, which is uh, a healer, mm -hmm. a holy healer, carrying the, the weight of God, if you want. And uh, of course, you have uh, the cross just over his head. Jacques Cartier, when he writes his Relation, uh, it's to show off to his king. So he doesn't show that he is totally scared, but he is scared. Cartier and his men will stay about not even 48 hours uh, on this uh, Mont Montreal soil. If you take the indigenous point of view in the, the writing of Jacques Cartier, you will... I uh, see another picture. I wrote an article, an article called Hochelaga Rencontre la France, which is Hochelaga is meeting the embassy, because that was an embassy. At that time, Hochelaga was the main uh, village. It was the only one who had a palisade around. One thing that is not shown here in the, uh, the, the stained glasses is that, first of all, the French were smaller in height than the indigenous. 
who are much taller and much stronger. We don't see women in this uh, stained glass, but women in uh, among the Iroquoian society were very powerful. It's them who decided who would come or go in embassy. So this is really a representation of 19th century historian, religious historian, Catholic historian, who wanted to, um, to celebrate uh, the coming of uh, the Catholic religion in America and uh, the triumphs of uh, French civilization over the indigenous civilization. Moving further along the Great Wall, the next window we come to depicts a scene from Paris in 1640. We can see here that this uh, man standing close to the altar is Jean-Jacques Ollier, the founder of this uh, society who originally was a missionary society inside France. Uh, Jean-Jacques Ollier is the founder of the Sulpician, Les, Les Messieurs de Saint-Sulpice. It shows here that uh, it was, um, it's a project that they have a holy and in, in kind of utopia to create a better world in the new world that would be exempt from all the defaults of the old France and uh, also who was, uh, which was uh, sustained by a, a group of people that were rich and uh, especially women, actually, at that point, uh, the Sulpician, they were just part of a group that wanted to uh, settle a mission, a holy city in Montreal. Well, in what was called uh, Ville-Marie at that time. The first French settlers did not arrive on Isle Royale until 1642, and the first Sulpician missionaries wouldn't arrive until 1657. Moving further into the church, the next window depicts the first mass at the new settlement. It, is, it was said that the, the first thing that they did in arriving in, in 1642 from Quebec City uh, was to settle an altar and make the mass, the first mass. I don't know if it's written somewhere, but it's a Jesuit who is doing the first mass. We can see that they are all well-dressed very well dressed for the time, uh, the men especially, but you have to imagine that very, very soon all these French will be uh, wearing, you know, uh, indigenous suits, we, we could say, uh, because these boots are not working very well in the wood, mm -hmm. and especially not in the canoe. It's the way they want to show themselves, you know, but uh, I invite you to see, to look at the, the drawings of uh, Francis Bach. All these people were not rich and they were poor people actually that would not be so well dressed, especially in the wilderness. We can see that there are only French people. For a very, very long time, 17th, 18th century, the um, indigenous and the French will be living together. So it's very weird that the, there is no indigenous. The next window depicts an infamous moment in local history when one of Montreal's founders carried a cross up Mount Royal. What happened is that on the 24th of December, we had a flood. A flood that threatened the little, very, very little encampment that was Ville Marie at that time. And uh, the, the, these poor uh, French, uh, they, they look at it and say, uh, uh, please, uh, Virgin Mary, Christ, anybody, they pray for the flood to stop. And suddenly it stopped. And uh, one vow that has done uh, Maisonneuve was he would carry a cross to the top of the mountain, which is about um, five kilometers in the mountain at the top. So he did. So this is why you can see him carrying the cross uh, like Jesus finally, in order to fulfill his vow 
the cross won't stay very long because the uh, indigenous will uh, put them put it down um, because it's a sign of uh, conquest also the cross on mount royal uh, what what is interesting is the cross right now it was built in the 1920s as well and of course this is the founding of that cross that you have uh, you have here the modern Mount Royal Cross stands 31 meters tall and overlooks the oldest parts of the city. The next window depicts the arrival of the Sulpicians in 1657. Here we are, 17 years after the, 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 the original idea of Jean-Jacques Collier and La Société uh, des Messieurs Dames de Montréal. It, it doesn't go very well on the economic point of view. And actually, the Société des Habitants is bankrupt. The Sulpician, who are now uh, an order of priests that uh, is very rich, actually, because they have many benefactors, decide to take over the, the, the Société de, de Montréal and transform the whole thing in a whole seigneurie, we call and uh, so they arrive uh, and uh, the transfer of power will be done a few years later, later. but they send four of their priests to be sure that the, the holy utopia go on. Across the sanctuary, the next window depicts a moment in the myth of Delard de Zemo. What you see of Dada here is one aspect of the myth that was created by Delier de Casson. Delit Casson is a Sulpician. He's the first who wrote the history of Montreal in 1671. For 1660, he emphasizes the role of Dallard des Ormeaux, who was French commander, let's say with quotes, who organized a raid on the Iroquois at the Long Sioux on the Ottawa. And Dallard is presented as somebody who, with his companion, left Ville Marie and met the Iroquois and died. It was more messy than that. Dada went there. Uh, he was accompanied, or actually, I think it's he, he uh, rather accompanied a group of 40 Hurons, when that Hurons, and Algonquins or Anishinaabe who were from uh, Trois Rivières. And uh, they went up there, they had, a, they had an encounter with the Iroquois. The Iroquois were much more numerous. Uh, they were about, about 600, 700 Iroquois. They uh, themselves were only 60. Uh, there was a fierce battle. They were defeated in the battle. Everyone more or less died or disappeared. Or in the case of Hurons, uh, they were adopted by the Iroquois. It was found out that uh, the uh, uh, Iroquois were gathering for their summer raids uh, on the St. Lawrence Valley. The, the effect of the battle, which uh, they discovered later, uh, actually, was that the Iroquois disappeared for the year. Uh, so uh, that, that's how he appeared to become a hero. One thing is that we say that because he fought until dying, they um, stopped the Iroquois. But that was not the idea. The idea of um, the, the Iroquois, they, they would raid, and as, uh, as much as possible, um, they would uh, go, go back in their country to celebrate. So they, when the, the second group arrived, the biggest group arrived on the site, uh, where the, the French has been all killed, they said, well, this is a victory, and they, they went back. That story uh, disappeared in, in the memories of people. Uh, especially since the manuscript on which the Yit Casson had written uh, was buried at the Sulpicians' mother house in Paris uh, and was discovered in, in uh, 1845. So it came back here as a copy and there it, then it was published and everything. Uh, and then the people discovered the role that uh, Dallard des Armeaux had played. So uh, the, the story of Dallard is really a story of, of, an, of an event that was not magnified really uh, at that time because you had that, that type of encounters every year <laughs> in New France. The French Canadian in the 19th century 
decided that it, it was a victory, if you want, yeah. on the Iroquois, which was not. It was the contrary. But at that point in the 19th century, we needed a hero that uh, would sustain the French Canadian Catholic spirit. A myth is always, is always it's a constructed story where you have different episodes that are uh, highlights of the, uh, of the event. Uh, and one of these episodes uh, is the oath that the 16 uh, other companions of Delar and Delar himself could make, make. So you see, that's why you see those guys you know, uh, putting up their hands because they are making that oath uh, during that mass. And then they go to the mass. I've actually, they went without telling anybody. That, that explains uh, really what you see uh, in, the, uh, on the, in the glass. In 1663, a Jesuit in Quebec will found La Congregation de la Sainte Famille, the Sainte Famille of the Virgin Mary, of course. Uh, this uh, congregation was made in order to help the congregationists, the people, the member of the congre congregation, um, to help each other and also to be guided in a moral uh, behavior and everything. Uh, this is a representation of morality and that is a share in order to build up uh, an idea that in Montreal, all these Montrealers were so pious and so morally correct. Moving up, the next window commemorates the Sisters of the Hotel Du of Montreal, a hospital built between 1644 and 1645, established by Jean Mons, who was one of the founders of Montreal. First of all, Jeanne Mans, uh, she arrived earlier than 1644. Actually, she is the financial minister of the Society of Montreal. The idea is to found an hotel lieu, an hospital. This institution lasts until two years ago. The idea underlying this uh, project is that if you help the body to heal, you will be able to uh, introduce religion. Of course, this hospital will serve everybody, but will care about the indigenous body before everything. Jeanne Mans is uh, shown uh, as Marguerite Bourgeois that we'll see in a moment, the matrons of Montreal, the, 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 the mother of Montreal. Jeanne Mans by choice, uh, she decided never to marry and never to enter a congregation or an order. Jeanne Mans was a lay person. She was not um, religious. Uh, she was not a sister, a nun. So uh, that's that's a, that's the interesting thing about that too. It, it's really that uh, the the, uh, the, found, the those foundations were made by lay people. You can see the hospitalières also um, that are there arriving with their bags. Actually, that would be a, a chest. She's shown. Even in the beginning of the 19th, uh, 20th century, but also in the 19th century, like a, an exception to her sex. Uh, but if you look at the history of uh, women, especially in France at that time, you can see uh, the importance of um, uh, celibate women in that time who were working, who were advancing health, education, and uh, social uh, care. The next window recognizes the Sisters of the Congregation of Notre Dame, including its founder, St. Marguerite Bourgeois, who lived from 1620 to 1700. She was canonized October 31st, 1982. Uh, Marguerite Bourgeois, here we, we have the famous tower, uh, which is still standing. This is one of the, the tower where she would teach. She will organize a little community in order to educate the, the kids. And she lives almost as a nun. I say almost because it's not a religious order at the beginning. What is education of the kids at that time? Uh, it's to make good Christians, essentially. This woman is Jeanne Lebert. She's the daughter of a very rich uh, merchant. And um, she decided that uh, she will never marry. She take all her fortune and built um, a kind of triplex behind the altar of La Congregation Notre Dame, 
and she spent her whole life like this. And she was meeting people through this little hole in the door, which was sealed forever, uh, and died in odor of sanctity. And mm. she embroidered these ornaments for all the, the churches around Montreal. So this is a kind of a saint, another would-be saint at that time, who is uh, Kateri Tekakwita, mm. who is Roquoise. She led a life of uh, mortification, great mortification. Another life of mortification is Jeanne Lebert, of course. So both of them has led this pure life in terms of Catholic uh, religion and virginity, of course. Jeanne Lebert is Canada's first recluse, and Kateri Tegetwitha is America's first indigenous saint. Tegetwitha is famous across North and South America. She was canonized on October 21st, 2012. For the next window, we leap forward in time to 1752. The window depicts Marguerite de Uvel, who was Canada's first Canadian-born saint, canonized December 9th, 1990. She founded the Sisters of Charity of the Hôpital General of Montreal, who are now called the Grey Nuns. Uh, she will take over... Um... Le, the hospital of um, Les Frères Charon. And what happened is that one of the Frères Charon um, literally bankrupt the society living with the, the money, the, the pro, <laughs> literary. And the suspicion came to this widow, Marguerite Zioville, who still has children to raise, and she, they said to her, we know that you know how to administer. So come, and she does it, and she organizes. Um, the hospital general is not an hotel dieu. It's not the same thing. It's two, two different things. Uh, L'hôpital général is where you go to die, where you go to be taken care of. But it's like mostly a social care. Hotel dieu is more for healing the bodies. There it's like, you come, we take care of you and you become what we, we need you to become, which is a good Christian and somebody more controllable. The last window takes another leap forward in time to the 19th and 20th centuries. The left window represents the Eucharistic Congress that was held here in 1910. The center window commemorates the Basilica's construction in 1829 and the right celebrates the 100th anniversary in 1929. Thus ends our tour through Montreal's history, as depicted by the stained glass windows at the Notre Dame Basilica. The moments selected for the stained glass are, unsurprisingly, all related to the city's religious history. But there are other reasons the windows look the way they do. The way that um, historians wrote in the 19th century was really to make up a nice story. Th those stained glasses really uh, are typical of, uh, of the type of history that was written at that time and uh, of the kind of story that they would uh, insist on. So it's, uh, it's a matter of showing our pride about our past. and uh, Really, it's a part of, of the commemoration, first of all. While the stained glass windows at Notre Dame de Montreal don't offer a complete history of the city, they too present a look into the stories that 20th century Montrealers thought were important from their city's history and moments they wanted to commemorate. Though the windows skew certain aspects of the histories they depict, the message they send is clear. French Catholics have had a continued presence in Montreal for hundreds of years, and religion has played a large part in that history. Special thanks to Dominique Delandre and Patrice Gros, who spoke with me. The Story in Austria is created, written, and produced by me, Aaron Isaac, and our theme music is by Brooke for Free. You can learn more at brookeforfree.bandcamp.com.